All right, we are back. We are recording this on a Thursday. So both wildcard games have just wrapped up. Today's first day of division series. My guy, how are we uh, how are we holding up after Tuesday? Tough one? Yeah, oh, man. Been better. I've been better. Uh, that was a brutal game. It was such a crappy game, honestly. Yeah. It was like, you know, it's one thing to kind of like lose in the ninth or something, like the Cardinals <laughs> did, but. Yeah. I mean, it was just like, you know, I've, I've been – I've had about a day and a half now to kind of think about it. And the worst part was that there was never a time during the whole game where I thought the Yankees were going to win the game. Like, right when Boston got out to the lead, that was it. Like, there was no time, no matter when. It was just like they had the game. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that was the shittiest part. Like, last night, it was like you could have thought the Cardinals were definitely going to win, like, the whole time because it was 1-1 right. into, like, the ninth inning. So, yeah, I mean it was tough. Uh I mean a couple couple things again to too. Garrett Cole had a terrible ending to the season, man. The last month <coughs> so, you know what I mean it wasn't just like that game. I, I feel no. like his last month was not good. And I you know, I'm just saying the obvious here, but for the money you're paying, um pretty disappointing and also like discouraging because of the whole spider attack thing that happened earlier in the season. So I, I don't know what you expect from him next year. Yeah, so I have nothing – I don't think that any spider attack is involved with him whatsoever because once that all happened, he had a few bad starts and then he was good for, like, over a month. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if it had to do with his hamstring or not. That's something That's that him and Boone both denied, but obviously they're going to deny that. So, you know, yeah, it's possible, but – I don't think spider attack was an issue. I just feel like it was almost like, I don't know, man, like Fenway almost got to him or something. Like he was, he was pitching scared to Bogart's endeavors the entire time. And His I mentality think definitely pitched, seemed different. Yep. Like it was strange. And like, you wonder if the hamstring is involved, but quite honestly, that's not an excuse because if your hamstring is fucked, don't pitch. Honestly, well, like you're, I mean, you're getting paid all the money, but like, if, if your hamstring is fucked and you can't do it, we would have probably a better chance to win with somebody else at full health. Like yeah. Depending on how really, bad it was. That would take a lot to get him out of that. But I, I see your point. Yeah, um, but, um, you... you know, I mean, like I said, though, like Bogarts hit that homer in the first. That was <laughs> – that just kind of set the table, man. And, like, Cole's mentality wasn't there then. He literally threw an 89-mile-an-hour changeup right down the middle. What do you I think, think Bogarts is going to do with it? Like, right, I, that was one of the things they were talking about on the radio. There, like Cole was, he was throwing everything at them. Like he had nothing. Yeah. He was just kind of emptying like the kitchen sink on them, yeah. and it just wasn't working. So, yeah, I mean, a couple, couple of things to get into. Um, Judge is thrown out at the plate after Phil Nevin, Phil Nevin sent him. Yeah, um, I forget what inning that was, but like, that was. You know, I don't know. That just kills a rally there where you guys are right back in it if he yeah. if he stays a third and comes home on a – or whatever scenario you want to say. But – Yeah. I mean, yeah, so I believe that was in the sixth inning because the Rizzo homered okay. earlier that inning. So Rizzo was leading off that game. So Rizzo hit a home run, then Judge hit a single, and then Stanton hit another, like, rocket off the wall, which – also sucked because at Yankee Stadium probably he would have had three home runs. No, that game, so. yeah, that freaking <laughs> the freaking green monster just eats up everything. Yeah, Dude, but man. um, so then that play, it's like Rizzo homered, and then like let's say you get Judge at third and Stanton at first, mm-hmm. like you got a rally, man. That would have been the time that I felt like we could get back into the game, and then Judge getting thrown out. I mean, dude, did you see like? On Instagram, I saw a picture of, like, the still frame of when the catcher got the ball. You couldn't even see Judge in the shot. That's how far away he was. So, and, like, he, it's not Judge's fault. It's the coach's fault. No, really. no, Judge no, yeah. did everything he could. And, you know, like, <clears throat> as bad as the game was, you got to give credit, too, to Kyle Schwarber, I think, because he hit the home run off of Cole also. And, like, he's kind of got Cole's number, man. He homered against Cole back in 2015 wildcard game when it was Cubs Pirates. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. Mm-hmm. So now, what, six years later, he did it the same thing? I mean, right. And you, you know, know, 
No, it's a good point. Also, we, like we could talk about how much Yankees messed up or whatever, but credit to Nate Valdi was nasty. Oh yeah. And honestly, man, look at this <clears throat> in the season. He had a very good year. Like yeah. his overall numbers are very good. So, um, like definitely become the ace of that rotation. But yeah, man, credit to him. He was very. And what good. I what I thought too was like Evaldi. We kind of crushed him like two weeks ago. Not even yeah. like a week and a half ago in Boston, yeah. we got like seven runs against him. And so like a lot of people before this wild card game were talking like, well, the Yankees got something on him. So I don't know. And like he quickly fixed that because we had so nothing on him this time. I think like, yeah, Rizzo is the only one that did anything really. Stanton, again, Stanton had the two singles off the wall, but right. um, Rizzo hit a homer off of him. Um, and look, Stanton did homer later in the game too. Also. Yeah. What I what I want from Yankees perspective, we'll get into the Boston perspective in a second. But what I want from the Yankees, no Yankees fan can talk shit about Stanton, Judge, or Rizzo ever. And like again, I hope, regardless of this, I hope that we resign Rizzo. That's besides the point, though. Mm-hmm. No one can shit talk Stanton anymore because he Absolutely proved again not. that he can do it in the playoffs. I mean, what was he supposed to do? Carry the team on his entire like on his back? Like he did, and we still didn't win. But like. I mean, he just—he's a great player. Everyone well, that, just that used and to also that. like the last two months of the season, he was like unstoppable. So. Oh yeah, like so that's how Stanton. But also, props for Verdugo. I believe he had a—he had three RBIs. I think he had a double off of Luisiga or Severino. Yeah. Um, so Verdugo, he, he man, did. he's always a guy that's going to come up in a big moment. I feel like he like thrives in that shit. You always see him do it, like in the regular season, even. Yeah. Um, and like. When Severino or Luizaga are struggling, they obviously didn't have their best games out there, which is really yeah. surprising because Luizaga has been so good the whole year. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, Verdugo is going to see that they're struggling and he's just going to take the opportunity to get some runs in. So good for him. He's someone – he's like a guy to watch, man, for me, the rest of the playoffs. If Boston's okay. going to go anywhere, Verdugo's got to be right in the middle of it, I, yeah. I believe. Well, where they're going now is Tampa Bay. They start tonight. <laughs> so – I mean, we'll get into it. I, I think Tampa takes them. I, I don't I don't really have a lot of trust in Boston, to be honest with you. But, you know, they take it. They're moving on. Um, shifting to Los Angeles last night. Again, I missed the whole game. I was out doing stuff. But um, yeah. it sounded great, though. So, not – obviously, it's obviously a pitching duel. Um, Tommy Edmonds scores in the wild pitch early in the game against Scherzer. Then Justin Turner – it's a bomb to tie it up. Also, he's the Dodgers postseason all time leader in home runs. Yeah, I saw that stat last night and I was like, that's nuts, dude. Like they've had so many playoff runs. Like I can't believe he's that's, the one, but of course he is. Like there's no yeah. other one. <laughs> no, I agree. And then um, you know, Taylor calls game. Taylor walks it off um yeah. against Alex Reyes. And yeah, they have Dodgers avoid a massive disappointment. I mean, if you if imagine going home after one game, <laughs> after a hundred and five, so and again, like it could have easily happened because it was one oh, one yeah. going into the ninth. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I mean, like credit to fucking Wainwright because he shoved like everybody thought he would. Um, you know, Scherzer pitched well, but he definitely didn't have his best stuff out there. Like, yeah. he had a couple innings where he would only pitch to, like, three or four guys and have above 20 pitches in an inning. Like, but, you know, he did what Scherzer does, and he, like, worked out there. You know what I mean? Like, even though he didn't have his best stuff, he knows how to pitch well enough that, like, it didn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it was – like, Alex Reyes, though, I, I talked about it in an article that I did, like, last week right before the playoffs started. The Cardinals' bullpen sucked in the second half. And as hard as he throws – it really didn't surprise me that he let up a home run because of how bad him Gallegos and Miller have been. Um, yeah. You know, not that he couldn't have turned it around in the playoffs and like, if the Cardinals went on a run, he could have changed everything up for himself. But that was interesting to me because I was like, you know what, if you really looked at the numbers you kind of could see that coming at some point. So I think they probably should have brought in Flaherty at that point, but they decided not to. So, uh, you know, you can never look back at that, though. What if, you know. You don't right, know I mean, you can play that all day. So, yeah. I mean, and now you're going to have the two best teams in baseball playing the division <laughs> series. I don't – I wonder when the last time that's happened is. 
you're going 106 wins versus 105. Like, so it almost sucks that it happens this early. You know, you would hope that they play I know. The championships or the World Series for yeah. that matter. Oh yeah, no, I agree. Um, um, but yeah, it might, I, might so be the best series it, of the playoffs. We'll say too. the Giants and the Dodgers have apparently never played each other in the playoffs. Like, I don't think since they've been San Francisco, LA, at least they may they, they never probably did. I don't think they have since it's been LA and San Francisco. I think they did when they were both wow. New York, but I don't think they've have yet. So that's also something interesting about this. I like, would not you wouldn't think that. that, but I saw something about it earlier this morning. So that's kind of interesting too. Um, but yeah, something I also took away from this game was that Kenley Jansen pitched good. Um, he did obviously pitch good. it wasn't yeah. it wasn't a safe situation. So. You know, but it was a tie game, so it's pretty much the same thing. He did let up a hit, but he struck out three batters, and two of those batters were Paul Goldschmidt and Tyler O'Neill. So it wasn't like the bottom of the order; yeah. like it was right in the heart of the order. So uh, that's definitely a good look for him coming out of the postseason. Really gives Dave Roberts some confidence and the fans too, because we've all They're seen the it. days where Kenley Jansen kind of is shaky in the playoffs. Um, you know, for Dodgers fans, it would be great to just be able to go to Kenley and not have any worries. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like not, ha- not have like Arias warming up in the bullpen as Kenley's pitching in the ninth inning. Like it, it would be nice to just feel comfortable with that, you know? Yeah. Um, also what happened right before, um, I mean, right after our last episode we recorded, Urias got to 20 wins. I did not know. Oh yeah. Had, not that I think wins is a great statistic, but like quick shout out to <clears throat> Like great season. Yeah, dude. I mean, this dude is a stud. Like, I feel like he's pretty underrated. I know he got noticed more last postseason, but like, mm-hmm. still, this year he was so under my radar. Like, I was just figuring he was having a good year, so I feel like I wasn't even paying attention to him that much. But um, twenty wins—that's pretty good. So, he's I'm like, not a big win guy either, but it's still no. a good. You know, it means that you're pitching well enough for your team to win the game, basically. So, right, still right. counts for something. So. Dodgers at San Francisco starts tomorrow, or tomorrow. by the time we, by which will be Friday at this point. Right. So those are the wild card games. We'll take a step back for a second. <clears throat> Let's talk end of season awards. So I'll have you start off with AL MVP. You can do like a quick breakdown of your top three guys, and then tell okay. me who your winner is. Well, I think the AL MVP is kind of the most self-explanatory top two, at least. Um, yeah, Otani and Vlad Jr. Um, I have Aaron Judge in the top three. Obviously, you could have gone Salvador Perez. It could have gone uh, Marcus Simeon too. But I believe mm-hmm. that Judge really impacted the Yankees the most out of any Yankee. Um, you know, nine sixteen OPS. He played one hundred and forty eight games. That's by far the most he's played in a while. So obviously, Aaron Judge was the best player on the Yankees. But I'm not going to give him this. Obviously, Vlad and Otani had way better seasons, even though Judge had a great year. So, you know, Otani, 46 homers, 100 RBIs, 965 OPS. Plus, he had 26 stolen bases and eight triples, which led the league. And then he pitched. He had a 9-2 and record, 3.18 ERA, 10.8 strikeouts per nine, over 23 games started. And he played in 155 games. And he had a nine war so wow that is insane he was an all-star batting and pitching um Mm -hmm. but vlad had a way better batting average not that everything's about average but he hit 311 compared to otani's 257 so vlad was getting on base way more um vlad's ops was over a thousand it was 1.002 um he also drove in more rbis he had 111 and he had 48 home runs Vlad also led the league in runs, home runs, on base percentage, slugging, OPS, and total bases, and he was an all-star. And he played in 161 games, so he only missed one game. Hmm. That's, to me, when I talk about, like, these awards, too, like, the amount of games you play is important. Like, if you if you were out for, like, a month, I don't really think that you should win one of these awards, like – and that's why I kind of have Judge at his third place, too, in this. Not that he was that far off, but it was, like, a significant drop-off from Vlad's 161 to Judge's 148 games played. Right. So, um, But, listen, man, I got to go with Otani. He had one of the best seasons ever, probably, arguably, the best season ever by a player. So, as good as Vlad had, Vlad was amazing. Like, any other I know. Year, Vlad I want to give it to Vlad. Just, there's, like, no way. <laughs> Like, I don't even think it should be like, close. 
there should be like an Otani award and then like a everybody else award because like it's not fair, but like yeah, Otani's got to win the MVP. I mean, he was amazing. It was just something that we'll never probably see again. Right, and I guess the other good thing about Vlad too is was he 22, 23? Yeah, like he might yeah. do this ten more times. So right, no, fit, no, awesome season by him too. Yeah, yeah, but um, I got to go with Otani there. So, um, I'll pass back off to you now. National League MVP, what do you got? What's your so, top three? I think here it's Tatis, Harper, and Soto. So, case for Tatis, he missed thirty-one games and still led the league in home runs, and like wasn't even close. He was about <laughs> six ahead of the next guy. Twenty-five stolen bases. I mean. Also, like, changed the position in the middle of the season. But that's almost a whole other conversation. But that's the case for him. Harper, highest OPS, basically up there in everything. Soto, Soto, I think, is an interesting case, too. Second highest OPS. And then after the All-Star break, 525 OBP, 1164 OPS, was just absolutely torrid. I think... Two, once, like, this isn't, like, a sexy step, but, like, 145 walks to 93 strikeouts. Like, he, dude, just because... Over, over the whole year? Yeah. Over yeah, the whole yeah. year? Yeah, okay. And, I mean, well, especially, like, I feel like in this day and age, too, like, with so many strikeouts, it's just <laughs> really impressive. So, yeah, I'm, yeah, I do not think this one is as clear-cut as the AL. I... I lean towards Tatis. I think just because of the production he put in, even missing basically a whole month, which is kind of what you just said. Like, can should he right. still win even after that? But like his per game production, I feel like is the best. Right. Ever. I mean, so like what I find interesting is that like he did, like I said, like I don't like to give guys that, but like he still led the league in homers by like a lot. Like mm-hmm. that's unbelievable, really. Like, so he played pretty much 130 games and he still led the league in homers by like, what do you say? Six or something. It was something like, like, like a that. So, um, I mean, that's insane. Like I, I feel like I agree with you in the fact that this race is definitely not as clear cut as the AL is, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think Harper was very interesting. I think that if, if the Padres or the, or the, or the Phillies made the playoffs, I also feel like it would have been easier to pick the guy who led their team to the playoffs possibly. But um, I mean, Tatis had a great season. I mean, I think that it's really easy to say that him and Otani are the faces of the sport right now too. Yeah. So, I mean, it would make sense that they would both be the MVP winners. So uh, yeah, I don't disagree with you really. Right. But going back to what you just said for a second, the whole like, Oh, they made the playoffs would have been an easier case. Is that something you value? Because I feel like that is a debate. Like, it, how good your team <coughs> is? Did you lead your team to the playoffs? Like, I'm kind of torn like on I th- that if yeah. I care about that or not. I mean, I think – I don't know. It, like, I do feel like it matters, but, like, I, I don't – like, for a guy like Soto, where they traded away everybody at the deadline, mm-hmm. like, that's not his fault. Right, like, like you're for, gonna punish him because his team sucks. Like, like yeah, like it. I, I think it's different in a year where like if they trade your whole team and you were supposed to be good and then you have nothing to do, like right. you can't do anything. But like, I don't know. Like it's obviously a different case with Otani too because the Angels weren't even close. But like his exactly, it's just so amazing that it like doesn't really matter. Um, but like we've seen Trout win it. A couple of times where like the angels weren't even close oh yeah uh i don't know i mean what do you think i think that's the direction i lean to i, I lead towards like it's you're literally just gonna go on stats and i'm not really gonna care how good your team is because like I, I just feel like that's most important i think like that's the best indicator of how good they are you know like best yeah. something like basketball is different like if lebron if the lakers just like suck this year maybe like i could see that her in like lebron's case because he just plays a more integral role in that whole team or name any other right. superstar for that matter. Um, right. Baseball is different. I don't, you know, you're one of nine guys out there. So that that's kind of where I lean. I don't really think team success is important, but I could see it going. Backwards. Like, so I look at it too, as like what a team would have done without a player. So like, yeah. One of the reasons why I have judge in my top three and not Perez I'm not like biased. It's just like, I have reasons for it because I think the Royals probably would have been just as bad 
without Perez because they weren't good, basically. Mm-hmm. If the Yankees did not have Aaron Judge this year, we would have probably come in fourth place in the division and been way behind Toronto. Like, without yeah. Judge and Stanton this year, we would not have even come close to where we were. So, like, I think he was the most valuable player, like, in the sense that it was like, if you didn't have him, we would have finished way, way worse, in my opinion. Like, I, I don't know that. That if that's the case with everybody, but, like, you know, I, I think that that's a similar case with, actually, with Bryce Harper because Bryce Harper played so well and, like, the Phillies bullpen sucked and, like, a lot of guys didn't have great seasons. Like, right. without Bryce Harper, the Phillies would not have been close to the division with a week left. You know what I mean? I don't mm-hmm. think they would have. But, like, it's not the same with everybody. Like, Juan Soto, the Nationals probably would have been just as bad if they didn't have him. It's, like, very interesting yeah. in that aspect, too. So, But that's, that is also something that I look at when I look at these uh, awards like that. I feel that. I feel that. All right, let's yeah. shift to um, AL Cy Young. Probably the less interesting Cy Young race, but still, <laughs> give me um, your top three for that. Yeah, so I, I would say about like a month and a half ago, this was way more interesting. Now, I think there's really a clear guy that's going to win it. Yeah. But uh, so my top three, I got, obviously, we talked about Garrett Cole earlier. He's in the Cy Young talks for sure. Uh, he led the league in wins, which, again, take wins as whatever you want. He had a 3.23 ERA, 12 Ks per nine. Uh, He started 30 games, and he had 181 innings pitched. And he had 243 strikeouts, which was second in the AL. Um, Then you got Robbie Ray, who had a 2.84 ERA, which is honestly significantly lower than Cole's. Uh, He only had about 11.5 strikeouts per nine, but he led the league in ERA. Game started. He had 32 games started, 193 innings. And he led the league in strikeouts with 248. And he also led the league in whip. So that's a lot of stats to lead the league, and he kind of was a big reason for the Blue Jays' run. Right. Um, and I, I think, like, for third, for a guy that's, I like, at least to put in the top three, um, you know, Lance Lynn is who I got in there. There's probably a couple other guys we could have gone with. Like, I think Barrios had a pretty good year with Toronto also. Um, but I'm going to go with Lynn because he started out so good. He kind of dropped off a little bit. I believe he did get hurt for a couple weeks too because he only started 28 games. Uh, and he only had 157 innings pitched. So that was kind of significantly lower than theirs. Um, but he was 11 and 6, 2.69 ERA, only had about 10 strikeouts per nine. So he was obviously the ace of the White Sox this year, but I don't think that he's even really close to them. He kind of did drop off within like the past month. Yeah. Um, you know, if Cole didn't have that stretch where he sucked for five games, I probably would be a lot closer right now, but I'm going with Robbie Ray. Um, he probably had, this is the best season of his career by far. By far, uh, Yeah. He I had was, one good season with Arizona, but this was definitely way better than that. Yeah, definitely. Also like a breakout of the year candidate, you know? So I, yeah, I, I feel like this one's pretty easy. Um, yeah. Would have liked to see him in the playoffs, but you know, Toronto came just short. So yeah. Yeah. I'm going right with there. Shifting yeah. um shifting National League. This one's actually like a pretty good race. So um yeah. you know, I gotta go Jacob DeGrom, you know, easily best pitcher now in this mess with it. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, it was he um, was healthy, man. Well, no, I, I think he definitely would have been, but unfortunately, yeah, 15 starts. So at this point, it's basically for me at least, Corbin Burns, Scherzer, and Zach Wheeler. I Walker Bueller, I feel like just kind of fell off in the last month. Otherwise, he definitely would have been in there. So Burns, lowest ERA. Also, going to FIP for a second, his is like 1.6. Like something really? stupid. So like he's actually like far better than he looks, like just based on like so that kind of tells me, I guess, the Brewers defense isn't particularly good. But I don't know. That, yeah. That's just the first thing I would take from that. But also, right. I forget the exact number. Somewhere like 240 strikeouts. Um, big breakout from him, even though he was pretty good already. Yeah. Scherzer, I mean, towards second half, he just like stopped giving up runs. He <laughs> one point. Okay, numbers 1.98 year right, with the Dodgers. So, so I believe too though. I I was watching the game last night. So he his last two starts with the Dodgers were really bad. So that did kind of skew it. If, yeah, if I was going to say that number out, looked a little higher when I right. looked at it and now. I think before, 
before those two starts, his ERA was like below one. I'm pretty sure with the Dodgers, so it kind of went up a little bit. But still, I mean, 1.98 ERA is good. Right, and then for Wheeler leads actually i'm pretty sure he leads the entire league in war which i don't really understand but regardless yeah, yeah, yeah. 2.78 era leads the um, nl strikeouts 247 um i feel like he might have tell off a little bit towards the end to, to also but i think for me i gotta go burns i just i mean yeah. lowest era the FIP, like I mentioned, he also missed, I think, around four starts or so. So okay. I think he would have easily led the league in strikeouts. And you know what I'm actually just remembering as I'm saying this is remember that, that run he started the season on? He had something like yeah, yeah, yeah. 50 strikeouts and like no walks. Something right. just like absurd. Yeah. I remember that. I think it got broken in San Diego or something. I remember when he did that, though. Right. And like, yeah, I mean, Burns is obviously – like the ace in Milwaukee, even though they have Freddie Peralta and Brandon Woodruff too, mm-hmm. who also had great years. Um, it's hard not to give it to him just because of how great a season he had. Um, you know, I had Zach Wheeler on my fantasy team, so I was seeing what he was doing the entire year, and he was really great this year. But, yeah. uh, you know, I just – and then like Scherzer, again, with L.A., he was awesome. But I think you got to go Burns because he was that good. The FIP is amazing. I can't believe that. His yeah. is like 1.60. Uh, so, honestly, I'm really interested to watch him in the playoffs because he's going against the Braves first. Um, that should be a really interesting matchup. I mean, yeah, we've talked about all season, but that top three of him, Woodruff, Peralta is going to be nasty. So, Oh, yeah. Give me, a, give me an AL Rookie of the Year. Okay, well – Obviously, we got Randy Rosarino, who is somehow still a rookie, even though I feel like we've been hearing his <laughs> um, I mean, this season, he had a pretty solid year. Uh, he, he had 20 homers. He also had 20 stolen bases, so that's pretty solid for a rookie. Uh, mm-hmm. 815 OPS. He played in 141 games, so uh, he had a great year. Uh, another guy is a guy we talked about a couple weeks ago, I believe, Ryan Mountcastle on the Orioles is still yeah. a rookie, too. Um, this year he had 33 homers, 89 RBIs, a 796 OPS. Uh, he played in 144 games and, uh, I got on the Rangers who had really like a low key, great season that not many people talked about was Dulles Garcia. Um, mm. this dude had 31 bombs, 90 RBIs, a 741 OPS, 16 stolen bases. And he led the American league with 16 outfield assists in the field. So when you look talking about defense too, he was great in the field and he played in 149 games too, which was the most out of all three. Okay. Um, So obviously they all had great seasons. Um, We talked about how great Mountcastle has been, but man, I got to go with Garcia. The fact that he's that good defensively plus his offensive numbers. I mean, I know he did drop off a little bit in the second half, but he was an all-star. Um, I mean, he has speed, like he's got the 16 stolen bases and like he has a cannon. Um, so I take that into consideration a lot compared to the other two's defense because Mountcastle really plays mostly first base and designated hitter. Right, and, uh, right. A Rosa Reina is okay in the field, but he's not like, I mean, I don't know. Just when you got an arm like that and you have 90 RBIs and like in your rookie season, I think that that is a clear favorite for the rookie of the year in my opinion. Yeah, I was gonna say because I feel like that's showing he's good with runners on. Um, yeah, I'm I'm gonna go him too. Yeah, I, I just feel like the combination of the outfield assists and yeah. going 31 and six like 31 homers, 16 homers, ugh, can't speak stolen bases <laughs> his first yeah. year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially on a team like the Rangers too, because they're not good. Like for right. Mountcastle to have like 89 RBIs too is kind of awesome because the Orioles were bad too. Like, but yeah. Um, you know, I think it just means that whenever guys were on, they were driving them in. And that wasn't very often, obviously, because the teams weren't good. So whenever they were on, they were good at driving them in. Uh, so, yeah, I think Garcia had a great year. I'll be interested to see what he does next year because, like I said, he dropped off a little bit in the second half. His defense didn't, but his offense dropped off a little bit. So I'll be interested to see if he kind of levels out and he's maybe like a 25 homer guy, okay. 80 to 90 RBI guy, or if he's going to get even better. So, uh, we'll see, but he's still relatively young too. So, okay. What about National League? Who do you got? 
So <clears throat> I have Trevor Rogers, Jonathan India, Patrick Wisdom. So Rogers in 25 starts, 2.64 ERA. Like honestly, not pretty close to the Cy Young guys we just talked about. Not that he was really yeah. in consideration at all, but um, yeah. India, 376 OBP, 21 homers, 12 stolen bases. He fell off towards the end of the year because he was on my fantasy team and he kind of just stopped at the end. But still yeah. very, very good. And then Patrick Wisdom, 28 homers in 105 games. So, yeah, pretty, uh, I think uh, Wisdom is a guy we talked about, I believe, like, I don't know, a couple months ago, maybe. Yeah, it was a while uh, ago. We were talking about how he kind of was hitting homers like crazy, though. So, I mean, think about that. 28 homers in 105 games, that's nuts, really. Yeah, so he definitely has like 40 homer potential for a full yeah, season. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm like slightly leaning towards Rodgers. I just feel like 2.64 over like essentially a full season on a bad team. He doesn't strike yeah. out a ton. That's one thing. That's kind of a knock. But so I don't know. So that kind of tells me maybe he'll slip back a little bit next year. But I'm going to slightly go towards Rodgers and then – India like slightly behind them. Yeah, I think if India kept it up, he was like the clear favorite because yeah. he was hitting like a beast the whole year. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> for me, Wisdom had to play more games. Not that it was his fault, because I believe he right. got called up a little bit before they started trading everybody. Mm-hmm. So it's not like it was his fault, but I I need more games played out of him for him to win the award. Um, Rogers, I believe, was my favorite too. Uh, 25 starts, so he he was the only Marlins that Marlins player that made the All Star team too this year. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and it's not like they just picked him because they needed someone from every team. Like he had a great year. No, so. he was legit. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, and I think, dude, that Marlins rotation going forward is something the NL East has got to look out for because now you got him who's really proven to be an ace. Alcantara is a beast. Uh, Sixto Sanchez didn't even pitch this year, and he's going right. to be back next year. And uh, Pablo Lopez, Lopez is really good, too. Um, so to have a guy like a lefty guy who's kind of more finesse than strikeout to go along with those top three righties, too, and Rogers is awesome for the Marlins. Um, he kind of remi- – not like his pitching style, but the way he gets a lot of grounders and stuff, he reminds me of Dallas Keuchel a little bit. Like Dallas okay. Keuchel back yeah, in the day was like yeah. a big uh, – you know, he was like a big – ground ball guy put it in play and still have the ERA down. Obviously this year he didn't have a great season, but uh, regardless, like I think Rogers is kind of like that type of guy, or he even reminds me of like Nestor Cortez on the Yankees really uh, yeah, this year, Nestor. because I think they just know how to like keep guys off balance. You know what I mean? So uh, great season by Rogers for sure. Yeah. And then um, yeah. we'll wrap up the <clears throat> managers of the year. So give me a AL. Um, well, so I think in the AL, there's really three clear choices, in my opinion. Uh, Alex Cora is one. Regardless of how you feel about Alex Cora with the Houston Astros cheating scandal, all that stuff, he has a way with the Red Sox players. Um, you know what I mean? He really knows how to be a great manager around them. Uh, he brought them from fifth place to second place. Obviously, it was a shortened season, so they may have figured some stuff out last year, but I'm not sure they would have. Um, and they had a 92-70 and 70 record. Um, my next guy is Charlie Montoyo for the Blue Jays. Uh, I mean, the Blue Jays had expectations, but like he really, I don't know if it was him or if it was just the players, but I think he had a lot to do with it. He, they were one win away from the playoffs Mm -hmm. for a team that was kind of like not projected to win the East and maybe not even projected to make the playoffs this year, but be close. And they were close. So I got to give it to him and uh, Scott service with Seattle too, because they were two wins away from a playoff berth. There were no expectations for them whatsoever. And uh, they had 90, I think their record was 90 and 72. So they had another solid, they had a great season. Honestly, we talked about the run differential, but throw that out the window for them this year, because they were still that close. And I think it really had to do with service, like being a guy in the clubhouse, like, look, let them let them say we're not going to make it. Like, let them say all this stuff about us because we're still going to be close. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, I mean, they all had such great years with teams that, like, weren't necessarily supposed to make the playoffs yet, and they were all that close. Um, but I think as much as it pains me to say, I got to go with Alex Cora. Uh, I just think it's obvious 
how good he is with the Boston clubhouse. Yeah. And he, I mean, just think about the guys that had shitty seasons last year that all of a sudden were back to normal when he came back. Devers, Bogarts, J.D. Martinez, uh, Nate Eovaldi, Eduardo Rodriguez, like so many guys, Matt Barnes. Um, not that it all had to do with him, but I think it was obviously something to do with him being back as the manager. I don't know how you feel about Cora and all that stuff, but I think he's he's proven that he's a great guy in that clubhouse, regardless of how you feel, how anyone feels about him. This is a tough one. Um. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm going to go – I kind of want to go Scott Service. I mean, because yeah. I feel like, especially the differences too, like the Red Sox have some stars. Like not to knock on court, but like, you know, they, they're a pretty talented team. Seattle, I feel like, kind of just pieced it together. I mean, Mitch Hanniger went on a run towards the end of the season, yeah. especially that last – the second last game. That was insane. Yeah. That was a great uh, game. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I just like he did the most – with the least so i got yeah i, I know that it was the playoffs i know but they also won 92 and like i feel like the bar to get in this year in the al was so high so yeah i'm gonna go scotty but was, i thought it was yeah a very good i mean season. it was probably fluky so, too you know the run differential was like bullshit but like they, you know, they though, 92, so and seattle's up and coming like yeah we can talk about how the run differential was fluky all we want you know what my prediction is that next year that differential is going to be flopped the other way because I can see I it. think yeah Kelnick is going to have a great season next year. He kind of got alive there in the last month. Um, Hanniger is going to be a beast, barring any injury. And uh, mm-hmm. you know what I think? Again, like I think after the postseason's over, we'll kind of get into every team's needs for the off season and stuff. But Seattle's number one need is to get Kyle Seager back. Whether they pick up his option or they give him a new contract, keep him there for his whole career. Because if you want to go and kind of get better in that division, you need him. Because did you see how, like, sad everybody was with the fact that Kyle Seeker might not be coming back? All of his teammates, they were, like, crying and stuff. Mm -hmm. It was crazy, dude. Like, he means so much to that organization. I think that is the number one priority for Seattle. You have to get him back. So No, absolutely. um, Yeah. But to go over the National League Manager of the Year, who do you got? There's some good choices over there. I was going to say, this is another very close one. So Gabe Kapler of San Francisco, they went 106. What would they project to be, like, third or fourth? Like, I, I feel like they had, like, almost no expectations this year. So I, I probably third, I'm assuming. Right. So but like, that's crazy. So I feel like in some years he'd be, like, the runaway candidate. But then you have Mike Schilt of Atlanta, who, I'm sorry, Cardinals, who <laughs> yeah. they pull off this run towards the end of the season. Um, you know, I don't know. I just, like, when it mattered, they got it done with, what was it, 17? 17 in a row? Something like yeah, that. Yes, so it was 17 in a row, yeah. And so, I don't know. I think even though they lost last night, I feel like you make the case for them. But then actual land manager, Brian Snicker, they get <laughs> – they finished with 88 wins after losing like everyone. Lose Acuna and Soroka. Yeah. And Osuna. And yeah, man. I I mean, they just pieced it together, man. Like, and Snicker really held it together there. So I think, yeah, I, I think that's still gotta go Kapler just because like 106 is crazy. Even though, like, you know, they're obviously in better circumstances than Atlanta fell into, but I, like, slightly lean towards Kapler. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just you got to give it to Kapler. The Giants were just not expected to do anything. Like, mm-hmm. the Cardinals were kind of supposed to be around, and, like, the Braves were supposed to win the division again, and they did. But, like, I mean, I predicted the Cardinals to win the division because of the Arenado trade. Yeah. And then – they did so bad and then they started to do good in the second half, but Kapler really just the whole year, everyone was waiting for the giants to drop off and Kapler never let never the did. players think that ever. So he was like, what, like, we're going to do this. Like we're good enough to do this. And like, they proved that they are. So I think it's gotta be Kapler for sure. No, oh, agreed. All right. So we're going to do quick preview of each series. Just kind of 
going position by position, um, clear advantages or best matchups. So for White Sox and Houston, what are you looking at? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, like, obviously there's some positional matchups. Like, if you're going, like, center fielders, Luis Robert is better than Jake Myers. No offense to Jake Myers, but I honestly don't really know who he is. Whoever so. that is. I'm sure he's a great guy. Uh, yeah, uh, but so uh, obviously, again, like Robert's better than him. I would say, like, you go Altuve over Cesar Hernandez, although he's had a great year. Yeah. Um, but third base, this one, I would go Yohan Moncada over Alex Bregman. Um, mm. And I feel like that's a little controversial, but I just like Yohan Moncada as a switch hitter. I think that's a great thing to have. Um, also, Moncada has played second in the past. He can play short. So let's hope there's no injuries. But, like, if there is, you can feel good having Moncada move around the infield. Um, plus, he's not, like, he's a power hitter, but he can hit for average. He's, uh, I mean, I just think he's, to have a switch hitter like that in the middle of your lineup, I feel like is very important in a playoff series because yeah. then you, like, you can't just go, like, a righty and feel comfortable with it out of the bullpen. You know what I mean? Uh, right. So, I mean, I think that Moncada, that's close. I've got Bregman has obviously a great postseason header, regardless of the cheating situation. Uh, he was good last year. So, I just think Moncada is better when it comes to putting the lineup construction in there. Um, and I also think that the White Sox pitching staff is better than the Astros. Um, I think that's kind of obvious. but Yeah, that one's Framber pretty Val- steep. Fram- but McCullers has had a great year, and Valdez is also pretty good. But Granky hasn't been great, and Odorizzi hasn't been great. But they have had good years in the past. So, like, it wouldn't surprise me to have them kind of all of a sudden have a great October. But I just think Lynn, Giulio, Rodon, and Cease are way better at this point. So, uh, yeah, I think, in my opinion, the White Sox kind of have a little bit of an advantage. But it's going to be a good series, I think. No, it's going to be close. No, agreed. I think, yeah, we'll go into actually predictions in a little bit. Um, Looking at Tampa Bay and the Red Sox, honestly, I feel like most of these matchups by position are pretty, (coughs) pretty even. I would say at second base, like Brandon Lau, I would take over Christian Arroyo. Um, Right field, I think is interesting. Hunter Renfro has an awesome season. I mean, we talked about him a little bit last time. So I would say a slight edge for him over Randy Rosarena. Rotation's interesting too. I mean, the Rays, even without Glass now, have put it together with, yeah. I'm not even sure if I pronounce his name right, McClanahan, Rasmussen, Baz, all of them. I feel like I've just, like you would, I honestly have barely heard of these guys. And they're just, they find a way though. Like these are the top yeah. three. And Sale, I, I think Chris Sale will be a huge factor as well. How much he has left. We talked about Evaldi. Yeah, I'm looking at like Nick Pavetta being the Red Sox third starter. Not not a ton of yeah. confidence in that. So I, I yeah, I would say Rays take the rotation as well. Designated hitter, I would take Cruz over Martinez. So So DH is interesting too though, because we were wondering if uh J D was gonna make the roster or not because Oh true, cool. true, true. And uh so it did just get announced this morning that J D Martinez is on the roster. So I'm not sure if that means that he'll be starting right away or if he still can't play yet. Maybe mm-hmm. he'll just be relegated to pinch hitting duties, in which case Kyle Schwarber would be the DH and then Nelson Cruz would be the DH for the Rays. I think I would still take Cruz, but Schwarber can really get hot. So that would be an interesting case uh, if that happens. But obviously, best case scenario is that you have Schwarber at first and JD DHing every game. Uh, you know what I mean? Obviously, right. Bobby Dahlbeck, we talk, he's had a great year too, but. Uh, Best case scenario is Schwarber at first, Martinez at DH. Yeah, and also I forgot to mention left side of the infield, Bogart's endeavors, I would take over Franco and Wendell. But, yeah, I I still think just somehow, like, from top to bottom, I think the Rays just have a better overall roster. Like, not on paper, but they they somehow – No, yeah, they're more than the sum of their parts. And, yeah, yeah, we talk about a lot with the the amount of – the amount of money they put in um, compared yeah. to Boston is probably like a fraction, but they still, yeah. I know. They're still better, man. I, I still take them. Yeah. So uh, moving on to the Dodgers and the Giants, going to be a great series. Uh, oh, yeah. 
I think that there's some interesting ones here. Like, I think I personally would take Buster Posey over Will Smith. And that's literally by, like, this much, man. Like, because yeah. I just think if, even though Will Smith now has a lot of postseason at-bats, Posey has more. And oh, yeah. I think that Posey – I mean, he, the moment's never going to get too big for Posey. Uh, and I think that, like, Will Smith is great. He was on my fantasy team. I love the guy. But I just think that Buster Posey has an advantage – because he's also had a great year this year out of nowhere, and I don't see that changing because the Giants have been the Giants this year. That's been the story right. of their team is, like, guys like that have just stepped up the whole year. So I think that Buster is going to keep doing that, especially with Brandon Belt can be out. Um, so speaking of that, too, first base is another interesting one because Brandon Belt is out, and so is Max Muncy. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, yeah, which one is bigger. Yeah. But um, I would take Wade Jr., and Wilmer Flores at first over Beatty and Pujols. Uh, you know, oh, again. Okay, that's interesting. I hmm. would take the Giants just because of how good Wade has been. Like, again, for another reason why, like, they've just figured it out the whole year, and I don't see that changing. Uh, you know, Beatty's had some streaks where he's been good over his career with the Dodgers, but he never had consistent playing time. Pujols is going to be on the latter part of that platoon right now because Beatty played yesterday against a righty against Wainwright. So I believe right. that Beatty is going to play against all righties. And I think the Giants only have one lefty in Alex Wood who's going to be starting rotation. So Pujols may get to start that game, but otherwise Beatty's going to get the starts. So I would just take Wade Jr. and Flores because of the years they've had. And, uh, you know, Flores has also played in the playoffs a little bit. Yeah. And obviously, Beatty hasn't played much in the playoffs, so uh, that's why I would take I, them, too. I would also like to point out that Mets legend Billy McKinney actually came in for her for first base um, oh, yeah. later in the game. So, I, I, you know, I think that's the X factor. But Right, right. Yeah. Hey, well, the Mets just keep, you know, maybe you'll see McKinney and then you'll see Wilmer Flores at first for the Giants, two former Mets. That's true. Mets, that's know. true. Yeah. yeah, no, never should have let the item go. <laughs> no, definitely not, man. All right, well, who do you got for uh, Brewers-Braves? What do you got for those matchups? Yeah, so like we broke it down, I I think Brewers rotation is arguably best in baseball, if not like two. So I'm taking them over Freed, Morton, Anderson, Smiley. Although Morton's actually had a very good season. I was like not aware until I looked last night. Has been very yeah. good. I also – it's funny, like on paper, I feel like I take the Braves on so many of these positions. Darno over Nervaez, as a catcher, Freeman over Vogelbach, Albies over Wong. But, it, which is weird because the Braves have such a better season. So yeah. I, I would say I'm curious to see how Yelich does as well, if he can really get going again. I mean, we said that all season, but now that it's really crunch time, he matching up against Andy Rosario. Jorge Soler versus um, Avaseo Garcia as well. And then closer, I, I got to go Hader over Will Smith as well. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, honestly, now I'm looking at Atlanta. It does look better on paper, but it's, it's almost like the whole race thing, you know? Yeah. Like, I feel like um, a guy like Willie Adamas is going to have a big impact on the series because of right. just the energy that he brings. Not that he's necessarily like a better player than Dansby Swanson, but I just think his impact is going to be more so than on the field play. Like if he if he plays great on the field, good for him. But like I think he's even more of a bigger guy. Like when someone hits a homer, he's going to get the team hyped up, all that kind of stuff. I think that you put that into account there. Um, I think that center field is interesting because you got kind of two platoons out there you got Kane True. and Jackie Bradley with the Brewers and then for the Braves you got Duval and Peterson who by the way all four Braves outfielders were not on the team on opening day they were I all traded really huh so that's kind of nuts too um obviously Duval was on the team last year but then he started this year with the Marlins and then got traded back over uh God, that's really a so that's kind of how wacky their season has been that's crazy yeah, and every single Braves outfielder since they've come over has been great, too. So, yeah, you know, I mean, honestly, Solaire has turned his season around since he got there. Eddie Rosario, too. Um, but, like, too, again, if Yelich goes off, that's a totally different situation. If he's, like, MVP Yelich, watch out. Mm -hmm. um, and 
Like, if we were going straight up bullpen, I would honestly still go to Brewers, even without Williams there, because I just feel like they have more pieces than the Braves do. But yeah. not having Devin Williams, man, is going to be brutal for them. That sucks. I mean, Hayter is going to probably have to get some more innings now, uh, too. Mm-hmm. And that's – obviously, he will he's great, so it shouldn't affect him. But, like, it might affect him later on in the fucking season in the playoffs if they make it there. So that's interesting to me, man. I know that Williams could come back in the World Series, possibly, if they make it there. But I don't know, man. That We'll talk about that a little bit later, too. But that's a big injury to talk about. Yeah. And then let's fly through some playoff brackets. Just give me each each series, uh, the winner and the amount of games. All right. So I got White Sox beating the Astros in five games. I think that's going to be a very close series but I do think that uh, Chicago will beat them out because of their rotation and because of some positional play like Luis Robert, Yasmani Grandal, I think is better than Maldonado too. Uh, and he has a lot of postseason experience. Grandal has postseason experience with the Brewers and with the Dodgers. So I think that's big. Um, I think that Tampa Bay beats Boston in four games. Uh, I really don't think Boston has a shot here. We've all no. seen Tampa kind of beat up on us and Boston this year. Um, I got the Brewers beating the Braves in five. I think that'll be a really close series also. And then I got the Dodgers beating the Giants in five. That'll be the most interesting one because that could really go either way. You want yeah. everyone wants to say Dodgers, but like you can't bet against the Giants, but I am here. So uh, okay. they might prove me wrong. So then in the CS, I got the White Sox beating the Rays in seven games. Again, I got a really close series there. Um, but mm. I just think the White Sox are going to do it, man. I, I got to special feeling with the white Sox right now i don't know there's just something brewing okay. over there i think they got something going and then i got the brewers beating the dodgers in six games wow i just have i have kershaw not being on the dodgers as kind of an issue compared to milwaukee's rotation that's um, true that's true not i mean it, again i think that I also just project that yellow is going to come out and do something and <laughs> i do i think okay. he's going to have a great postseason um, and I think that I believe it was in 2018 that the Brewers and Dodgers played a seven game series and the Dodgers won in seven games. Right. I think, I think yeah. it was the CS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I don't see the Brewers letting that happen again, even though that was three years ago, there's a lot of guys from that team that are still on the team. And I don't think they're going to want that to happen again. So I think that'll be a great series, though, um, Brewers-Dodgers, but I do think it ends in six. I just feel like the Brewers are almost going to beat them in L.A. in game five, and then they're just going to take it to the house in game six. The so Brewers go up 3-1. Wow, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Then World Series. I got White Sox-Brewers, and I got the White Sox beating Milwaukee in seven games. Dang, um, okay. And – my World Series MVP is Luis Robert. I think this dude has been a stud the past two months, and he's ready to go. Uh, ever since he got back from the injured list, he's been amazing, and I just see him going absolutely bonkers this postseason. I really do. Okay. Um, he's probably going to be in the MVP talks next year if there's no injuries. So I think this is a big postseason for him, and I think this is the first time people really see – what he's made of because this dude is amazing. So that's what, that's what I got. I got the okay. White Sox. Some bold little, picks little in there. Series this year. Okay. Yeah. So I have a few differences. I'm going to go Houston. Your, your White Sox, actually, they're again knocked down in four games. I think Houston takes four some. Games. So I, <laughs> and I hate to say that too, but like, I just feel like Houston has so much postseason experience with that roster at this point. Like, even last year with, like, their bullshit, like, under 500 season, and they still yeah. almost won the ALC. I don't know. I just kind of have a feeling about them. Like they just know how to get it done in the postseason. So They have the experience, man. They, they do. That's something that you – they're battle-tested. Yeah. So. I felt stronger about Chicago about two months ago. And then I feel like towards the end of the season, they just kind of looked eh. And they weren't beating yeah. over 500 teams like we talked about. So, anyway, right, right. Houston beats Chicago in four. Tampa beats Boston in four. Yeah, I don't know. I, I agree. I don't <laughs> I don't think Boston's yeah. particularly good. And I think Tampa is, like, fantastic. So, four games. Milwaukee takes Atlanta in four for all the reasons we've talked about. I just feel like up and down, like, the roster's pretty good. And the pitching, obviously. Yeah. Um, 
San Francisco's taking LA in five. It's gonna come you down to so? the wire. But yeah, I, I like <laughs> I just find it so hard to bet against them at this point. After every the fact yeah. they held them off down the stretch. There's uh-huh. some yeah, I don't know. Even just in one run games like their record, I just feel like they know how to win close games and they're gonna take Dodgers. So those are the division series. So then Tampa plays Houston. They win in six. Um that's would that would actually be a rematch of last year, right? No? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So I think I think they'd be him again. Second straight year. Um pretty confident in that one. And then I think San Francisco takes Milwaukee in six, which is tough as well. But I, I think they're just more complete roster. And for all the reasons I said with okay. the Giants. So that leaves the Rays and the Giants. And now I'm like second guessing this pick, honestly. Tampa and five. Oh, really? Yeah. Maybe I'm just too high. In t- I don't know what it is. I just there's something about them. I mean, the thing is, is that like those are two teams that you like people continually bet against, and they keep proving us wrong. So like, that honestly wouldn't surprise me. But I just, I don't know, man. I I personally, I don't want to see a World Series at fucking Tropicana Field. So. That's no, why I kind of don't want Like, you know, you just, like, punish the team just because they have no <laughs> yeah, money. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, that could happen. No, I could definitely see it being raised Giants because right, of so everybody we'll, betting against them the whole year. We'll keep the tapes. You have Chicago yeah. over Milwaukee in seven. I have Tampa yeah. over San Francisco in five. We'll come back to this in a, in a month and see yeah. how it happens. Yeah. Yeah, All yeah, right, yeah. Quick, quick injury questions to run to. Um, which team misses their first baseman the most? Um, Giants, Brendan Belt, or Dodgers with Muncie? I mean, I, as much as Muncie's a better player, I think Belt on the Giants because the Dodgers have so many more guys that can just replace him. Like, if they want to, they can move Ballinger to first and put someone else in the outfield. They have so many options. The Giants do have Wade and Flores, but, you know, I think they need them to kind of move around too. So I'm going to say that it affects the Giants more with Belt. Okay, I'm slightly leaning towards Muncy. I just feel like he's an MVP candidate and just, like, means a lot for that team's offense. So, I'll lean that yeah. way. Speaking of the Dodgers, how much I – mean, I mean, you kind of touched on this earlier. How much does losing Kershaw affect their chances to repeat? Man, as, as deep as their rotation is, I just think not ha- not having him is big because he's a guy, like, you could put in between Scherzer and Bueller, lefty – Big curveball, mm-hmm. doesn't really have his power stuff anymore. Um, you know, I think losing him is kind of important because now the Dodgers' four-man rotation in the playoffs is going to be Bueller, Scherzer, Urias, and Gonsolin, who no offense to Gonsolin, but he's not Kershaw. And, I mean, obviously other things have affected the Dodgers' rotation too, like the Bauer situation is one. Um, and then I think uh, Dustin May Dustin got Tommy May. John. So they had a lot of hits. He would have been, yeah. Time. So I mean, thank God they got Scherzer. Honestly, because yeah. if they didn't have him, they'd be fucked right now. So, but I think it affects them a lot. Honestly, I don't think they're gonna. I really don't see them repeating without Kershaw. I don't see it. I don't see, know about you, but and I feel that way. But on the other hand, like, do you know how much talent they've added to this team? You know, like, they fucking went out and got Scherzer, and, oh, let me just take this MVP shortstop with them. Like, I still yeah. I, I still don't, like, you know what I mean? I guess what I'm trying to say is if they don't repeat, I'm not going to be like, oh, well, if they had Kershaw. Like, no, I, I think they should get this done, you know? I, obviously, I didn't pick them, but I, right, right, right. I think it affects them, but they should still be able to overcome it. So that's my take. Okay. Um, and then – Last one. This is this is common unknown. How confident are you that Devin Williams comes back from Milwaukee? I don't see it, man. He broke his hand. He just had surgery yesterday. There's no fucking way he's back in three weeks. I'm sorry. That's just not going to happen. I mean, as much as I want to see him come back, I really would love to see him come back if the Brewers make it there. But well, right, because you're I mean, saying that they're going to the World Series and they're playing seven. Yes. Games. Yeah. But he would have to be on the active roster at game one. Uh, that's true, that's true. Unless Lay would have to, unless someone got hurt, then they could add him at some point after that. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, 
maybe they say someone's injured at some point. And I was just about back. to say like, that. Do you? I wonder how often this happens. It was possible. Like, oh, if, this guy has like a, a ham. He's tight hamstring, so yeah. we got to plug in this guy. Yeah, <laughs> it's possible. I think it's definitely possible. Uh, but I mean, when you break your hand and you have surgery less than three weeks before the World Series starts, that's tough, man. I don't know. What do you think? I'm going to say he comes back just because it's such a ridiculous, embarrassing injury that I think that's going to motivate him and his <laughs> recovery, Yeah, which might be total garbage. You know, I have known nothing about like medical procedures or anything, but yeah. I'm going to say just for like um, storyline's sake, he wants, he's going to try to come back as quick as possible. Okay. So. Yeah. And then a few notes again to, before we wrap up, um, not really related to postseason at all. First one, Mets did not pick up the option on Luis Rojas. This one surprised me. I was my dad texted me this, and I was like thoroughly surprised, just because yeah. I didn't. I don't know, man. I didn't look at the season. And was like, well, you know what the problem was? It was Luis Rojas. You know, there was so much that went wrong, and I, I yeah. did not think it was him. I don't know what you thought. I didn't either, but I just feel like sometimes in situations like this, they just have to put the blame on somebody, and like, it's. Most of the time, it's the manager, no matter if it's right or wrong, because you're not going to, like, release a fucking player just because, you, like, you right. know what I mean? You, you can't do that. Um, I believe that Rojas is going to get a chance somewhere else, definitely. not Maybe not probably. next year, but soon, because he was a great manager, I thought. Um, but what I thought was interesting about this is that Sandy Alderson has a good relationship with Billy Bean and Bob Melvin from his time in Oakland. That's and true. they – there's been talks about them coming to the Mets, dude. Like, I mean, if that happens, first of all, if that happens, that would be crazy because they have contracts with the A's. So this would technically have to be some sort of trade. I don't even know how that would work. Yeah, I was going to say, has that ever happened? I believe so. Not with like a GM and a manager like that big, but I believe something like that has happened before. Um, hmm. I mean, man, if that happened, though, I believe the Mets are going to get good quick. Because can you imagine Bean and Melvin getting to do what they do in Oakland only with money? With Yeah, with Stevie Cohen's wife. Like, like that would be insane. I, I mean, I would feel terrible for A's fans, but you know what? Right. I, mean, I could see it happening because I think Cohen wants to do everything he can, plus Sandy is friends with them. So I don't know what you think about that, but. Oh, yeah, I would take it. I actually never, like, even thought of that possibility until you just mentioned it. Uh, you know, yeah. I also just forgot. Like, we only have a GM. Nah. Right. So you, that's nah, we just right. very that's much the don't. point too. <laughs> so, I also do though feel that that's like a reason why you didn't keep Rojas because I think even if you don't get Bean and Melvin, I think Cohen wants to get a GM first and then let his GM pick a manager because, like, I think that he didn't want like Rojas to be in when he picked a new GM or something like that. I don't know. You see that situation sometimes. My like. Uh, Honestly, man, my brain almost just like hurts. Just like I don't not not because it's complicated, but just because like I'm just burnt out from all this. The shit. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, going back to a second for a second, um, about managers just kind of taking the blame. I kind of feel the same way with Jace Tingler. I oh, like I had no idea he was dismissed either. Like he's gone from San Diego. Yeah. And. I don't know. We talked about how like everything went wrong for that team essentially, where injury wise, yeah. performance. I, I don't know. Like what, what? This is still like a fantastic team, right? and I, I no, I just not like it's not his fault in my mind. It's definitely not his fault. Um, you know, I don't know whose fault it is. To be honest with you, I don't really know what went wrong, but definitely not his fault. Um, and it's like no one's going anywhere. Like they're not going to trade Machado and trade Tatis and trade all these guys. Like everyone's staying. So it's not like they're going to be – I mean, who thought they would be bad this year? So I guess you can't say it's not like they're going to be bad next year. But like they're supposed to be good. I think a couple of tweaks will make them good. I don't even know what route they go. Like do they try to go with a manager with more experience, being like Tingler never had experience? Like – I don't know what the answer is, but I don't think it's going to be much different. Like, I don't see right. a manager changing anything there. So if I had to guess, there's always stuff we don't know. If I had to guess, he must have had some sort of, like, beef with 
like a Machado or a Ty- like some sort of, like the stars there. Because otherwise, yeah. But and like they just didn't think it was like attainable anymore. Whatever the word for it is. Um, yeah. Because I think yeah. Otherwise, I don't really get it. Like so, there there must be something deeper there. Just my guess. I agree. Yeah. It's interesting. And then a couple other um, contract extensions to get into. Rockies extended CJ Krohn and Antonio Sensatella. Uh, Krohn, actually had a very good year. 905 OPS, 28 homers. So his deal is uh, two years, 14 half million. And Sen- Sensatella is five years, 50.5 million. Um, 3.9 ERA over the last two seasons. So, yeah, I mean, um, I think in Colorado, if a guy is able to get that ERA over the past, like it was about 40 starts being the shortened season, if he's able right. to get a 3.9 ERA there over two seasons, I feel like that's a guy you want there because he knows how to pitch relatively well. Mm-hmm. You're never going to get a guy there that has an ERA like below three. So let's just get that out of everybody's head. 3.9 in Colorado is probably like 2.9 everywhere else. So I think that's pretty good guy to have there. Uh, you know, I think Crone, it obviously helped him play in Colorado too the, with the power, but he's always had power. So I don't think yeah. it was that much of a difference. Um, I mean, the Rockies are a very confusing team. Let's be honest. Trevor Story is probably about to walk out the door. They're not going to be good anytime soon. Mm-hmm. So I don't really get this deal that much, either of them. But, you know, good for these guys to get paid, I guess, after they had good seasons, you know. Yeah, I don't know what direction they're going in, especially the stuff like this. Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, wrapping up real quick. What division series are the forward to the most? Um, yeah, for me, it's the White Sox and the Astros. I really think it's pretty even of a series. Um, mm-hmm. Again, I think the White Sox have a better rotation, but – they're also going to be playing in Houston with the fans there. It gets pretty loud. Um, the Houston fans are back for the first time in the playoffs since all the cheating stuff happened. So they're going to be loud towards every other team that comes in there. So I think that's pretty interesting. Um, I want to see how the White Sox young players react to to like the Houston fans and stuff because they've yeah. never had a playoff. Most of them have never been in the playoffs in front of fans. They were last year, but there was all the cardboard cutouts. That's a good so, point. I didn't think of that. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, like Lance Lynn, some other guys, Craig Kimbrell, uh, are going to be big helps towards the guys, like calming presences and stuff. But, like, you know, Giolito never pitched in the playoffs with fans. Um, mm. Cease, young kid, has never done it either. So I think that's interesting. Um, yeah. Plus, Dal- Dallas Keuchel is going back to Houston for a playoff series too. So that should be interesting also. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point, good point. Yeah. yeah. What about um, you? Yeah, for me, this one's pretty easy. Dodgers, Giants. I mean, not a super okay. exciting answer, but the two best teams. And... Yeah, I just think it's interesting. I mean, like we were talking about Kershaw being out will be a factor. Um, still can't believe the yeah. Giants game one starters Logan Webb, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't go Gosman game one, to be honest with yeah, you. Yeah, I, I mean, they but, were both good, but. Yeah, no, I just never would have thought that would be the yeah. best team in baseball. Yeah. We starting Logan Webb for their first game. Definitely but, not, but hey. No, but then that kind of leads into our stat of the week, going back to the Dodgers for a second. So – Kind of surprising, kind of not. Chris Taylor is the first player in Dodgers history to hit a walk-off homer in a winner-take-all postseason game. Uh, so, I don't know. Wow. I just feel like they've been in the postseason a lot. And not that walk-off homers are that common. I just would have thought between Brooklyn and Los Angeles, they would have had yeah. a win. Yeah, that's kind of – man, like, I guess it's not that common – for like a specific team to have, I guess so. Yeah, I feel like maybe we just get used to guys hitting them all the time, so we think it happens a lot. But maybe it's just like not guys on the same team all the time. Yeah, but still, man. The I mean, even just recently, the Dodgers haven't missed the playoffs since what 2012, 13. They haven't yeah. had one since yeah. then. Like, I mean, that's kind of crazy to be honest with you. Um, yeah, or like the Brooklyn teams they had that were so good, like 60 years yeah. ago. But, yeah, I mean, I also just the fact that Chris Taylor is the only player <laughs> as opposed to yeah. all the legends they've had. So Even Justin Turner's never done it. Like, yeah, that, that's all a those good homers. point of the <laughs> literally their leader in postseason home runs. But, yeah, yeah, so we will be back next week to kind of recap the Vision Series. 
But yeah, yeah. Man, it's gonna be a good good weekend, good next week as well. Oh, a yeah. lot of good stuff coming. Can't up. wait. Got a lot of good games this weekend. So uh everybody enjoy the games and uh we'll recap the DS's next week. All right, enjoy.